Welcome to Running with the Dweezil special today. How are you doing, Dweezil? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really good. This is a special episode. We're going to talk about this great podcast you have. When you started yeah. this, Ed was alive, right? Or the idea? Yes. Well, the thing is, it's it's not just about Edward Van Halen or his influence on guitarists and music. It's really about Van Halen as a band. Obviously, Edward's playing is one of the key factors okay. that makes everybody excited about the music. And through personal experience, my own personal experience and guests' interactions with Edward, it seemed like it would be uh, a good way to tell a story about his impact on music and the, the original plan and dream was to be able to collect stories from a bunch of different guitarists, talk about the albums in a way that was very in-depth, uh, talk about the production, talk about the songs, song by song and the elements within the songs. And after all of that stuff had been achieved, it was the dream to be able to present this to Edward and say, hey, there's so much of an outpouring of love and respect for your music. And these are what these guitar players had to say about your music. And the dream was to be able to go through it with him and ask him some even more specific questions about how he was inspired to do certain things on the guitar and how these things came about. So Unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to do that, but the music itself has been uh, under the microscope by my guests. And during our conversations, we've come up with a lot of different things that maybe hadn't been thought of before, just in terms of, oh, well, where did this come from? Or this influence seems to be showing up a few times. This thing is uh, being repeated here it's thematic or those kind of elements and in that way this becomes a very uh detailed history of the music of van halen and there's playing examples and there's little quirky things that happen every now and again with the storytelling and stuff like that so i think it's it's intended to to be a very historical document of the influence of the music of Van Halen from all the members, all of the things that they all brought to the music, but clearly filtered through the, the main focus of the guitar. I mean, have you discovered some crazy things that you never knew going through this? Definitely. Uh, I mean, I was always, you know, a huge fan of all the records and really into the growth and the different directions that the band would go into and particularly the new things that Edward would do whenever he was feeling inspired, you know? So obviously the first six records, it was just again and again and again, topping himself with new things, techniques, sounds, and it was so exciting. And you, you also have to put it into perspective at that time, there wasn't anything that resembled the, the social media stuff that's available today uh, where you can kind of look something up even with Google or whatever, or find videos or you basically were waiting. You saw pictures in magazines, you saw pictures in the album artwork. And if you were lucky, you maybe saw an interview on TV if it ever happened. This is even before MTV. And maybe you heard a radio interview. Otherwise, you were you listened to the records. You spent yeah. all this time just sitting there listening and people would line up to buy the records. People would line up to buy the tickets. You would see people um, being, they would camp out in the streets in the snow waiting to buy tickets to see concerts. And it was, it was such uh, an amazing thing to be a part of that time period to experience the music in that way because you were so motivated to spend time just being around the music and having it attach itself to your life. And so learning other people's perspectives when they had a similar experience uh to mine or if they came to it way later down the road and it's 
you know, post MTV and, and other things, everybody has their different way that they were brought into hearing the music and getting inspired by the music. But, you know, to your question, did I find some things that I hadn't heard before? There were certainly little bits and pieces. I think there was one thing um, in the episode with blues where we were talking about this, <laughs> there's some pretty funny stuff. As, as, <laughs> we're talking about this one thing that happens in one of the songs, and I think it's "Take Your Whiskey Home," but there's a um, a little weird sound effect that just happens on the right side, and I can't remember how we were describing it in the episode. It was sort of like the the equivalent of if you had a spinning bike wheel and you put something in the spokes and it made this weird little stutter sound, there's something that happens similar to that at one point. And I don't know why. And it just, you know, if you listen in headphones, it sticks out and there's that one weird little sound. And I don't know what it is. I, I only discovered it when I was editing the episode because I was listening to the song and I kept listening at one point uh, because I was doing an edit and I kept thinking, where's that coming from? Is there some weird little extra sound on another track? And I just soloed up the actual track from the Women and Children First record. And sure enough, it was in the audio from there. So it's something that would go by and you would never hear, but I ended up really focusing in on it and wondering why it was there and what it was, you know? So there was a little moment like that where we have similar things that happen from time to time in the episodes, but that is the first one that came to mind when you asked about. I like the fact, I like the episode when you're talking about Dave having the two voices, a split voice. Right. Really love that. That was something I didn't know. I didn't know myself. I'm not to give it all away because I want people to actually go on and watch this podcast if they haven't seen it. I you know, I listen to it and, you know, yeah. not give away all the secrets here, but the blues one, I'm going to tell you guys, hilarious. There is a really great story in there. there. You know, the thing about talking to people and learning things about them, you know, it's, it's very different from person to person. When you know someone well, mm -hmm. there's a chance that some, some pretty hilarious things are going to happen. And I know blues very well. I've known him for, I think, almost 30 years. Yep. And so he told me a story that I had never heard before. And having known him all this time, he breaks into this story and you hear us fall apart in that episode. And it's one of those things where it doesn't matter if what we think is funny is also what you think is funny. The funny part is that we can't get it together and you hear us keep losing it and that becomes funny in and of itself. So it's a, it's a moment that was fun to have captured in the process of making the podcast um and you know not every episode is lucky enough to get these kind of funny silly moments but there are definitely throughout the episodes are some funny things that do take place in the conversations and and sometimes in the musical demonstrations well what's great is it's not just there's funny moments there's smart moments there's like i really like the guest choice because there's certain guests that you have that i didn't know a lot about or I did like it. I was like, oh, Paul Gilbert, oh, Steve I, the, the obvious characters. But, you know, when you have um, Maroon 5 on or, or like, you know, different people like that that I'm not familiar with, it's really nice. I mean, there's a lot of information came out from those artists that a lot of us aren't familiar with, you know. How did you choose who would go on the show? Like, did you have an idea? Well, uh, originally when the whole podcast came together, there was some discussions with Premier Guitar, they were interested in doing something like this. So we ended up partnering to do this. And it was a list that was compiled in the beginning where we went through and we were saying, who can we get? Who's available? Let's mm -hmm. see what we can do. And so we had a, a, a list that we were going from and either from my own personal connections to some of these people because they're either friends of mine or people yep. I met or worked with. I would reach out to some people, but Premier Guitar would reach out to some other people that I didn't know. So there were uh, just a few people that I think were on their list of people that they wanted to 
include. So like Mark Tremonti was one of the guys that they said, oh yeah, we definitely should get Mark. And I, mm -hmm. I didn't previously know Mark. Uh, and at that point where I got to speak with him, you know, he, he was a, a guy that uh, I ended up having a lot of respect for his, the way that he goes around um, and teaches guitar uh, even when he's on tour, because I have done some of that myself. And the, the whole, uh, the, the way that he is excited about being a student of the guitar was, I think, something that we both had in common. So that was a fun thing to kind of get to, to know about him. But there's, there's people that um, I, I ended up learning things from, uh, like, uh, you know, the Jennifer Batten episode, we started talking about stuff about Jeff Beck, learning some things about, yeah. you know, Edwards playing and Jeff Beck's perspective on things and stuff like that. So it's interesting when you're able to, to find things about well-known players who do a certain thing and then how they fit into the same world as another well-known player. Where are the the places that intersect and stuff like that. So that kind of stuff is fascinating. I think that brings up another thing where I, uh, I realized that there's a huge Pete, uh, Pete Townsend influence and a, a huge who influence overall mm -hmm. in Van Halen that I didn't see all the way through their career. I knew they had done that cover song with Sammy that they yeah. did so well won't get fooled again. And I heard certain elements in the music of Van Halen, but as I was really focusing on song by song, I started to really see that there's a huge amount of Pete Townsend influence in the rhythm playing and also just in the, the arrangement of the songs and, and trying to build a certain kind of energy that was just part of the sound of the who. So, it's not that they were trying to completely emulate it and say, we want to sound exactly like the who, but it's, it's filtering that energy and the elements that make the excitement for a band like the who, but then doing it in the Van Halen style. And I think a lot of that um, wasn't obvious to me growing up, but having listened to a lot more of the who over the years, I started to make connections as I was listening to the Van Halen stuff with different ears. I listen to all the albums. I've had gone back now after each episode, like give it a week to like, you know, soak in, go back and relisten the album. I hear everything's so different now. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. The amount of uh, stuff you guys have picked out. The ones that really took a lot of effort to pull together, to really bring all the details out, the fair warning, there was two episodes on fair warning, one with Nuno Betancourt and the other one with Billy Corgan and two totally different perspectives on that same record. So that was a, a, a unique thing within the podcast to take a record and have two different guests talk about the same record. And that one being my favorite record, I wanted to really dive as deep as, as I could. And there were a lot of things that I found out during the process of going through the episode, doing some research, for example, Unchained was written on the piano. That's one of the most guitaristic guitar pattern kind of guitar riff songs, yet it wasn't yeah. written on the guitar. So that was fascinating to me that he wrote it on the piano and then ended up putting it on the guitar. Uh, so there's a few things like that, that over time, you know, uh, you change your perspective of, of the feeling that you have uh, for the song if you find out new information. I guess another thing that was funny about that episode to me was uh, as a kid, when I heard the solo, the outro solo to um, uh, One Foot Out the Door, that the first note of the solo always sounded like Godzilla to me. So I finally was able to reference Godzilla and the solo and put them yep. side by side and found out that indeed it's the same exact opening note. And there's a certain kind of character 
to the way that the, the, two, the notes have this converging set of harmonics and it's, the, it's almost the same character as what happens with Godzilla's voice. So it's, it's funny to me that it always sounded like Godzilla, but I didn't know how close it actually was. And it's the, the same pitch. Let's talk about the editing. You've had some challenges because sometimes you've had people, certain noises, certain things you gotta edit. Yeah. Some of your challenges. So one of the things that's difficult with the podcast and why episodes take longer than expected is when you record like we're doing right now over the internet, when you record an interview over the internet, even if somebody is recording their own voice, like you have a microphone in front of you, Mm -hmm. if you're recording your own voice and you're getting good level and it's direct sounding, there's still a delay with my voice. And if any of my voice gets into your microphone, that becomes an issue where when you have the two sound sources together, now there's a delay in there that you can never get out because it's introduced with the latency over the internet, which is also not constant. It's a shifting tide. So it requires thousands of slices to get those noises out or things that you don't want to hear. Now I could take the easy way out and just say, oh, just do no editing and leave it. But then when we have these kind of long conversations, there's, there's times where the pacing of it might not be as enjoyable to listen to if you don't just tighten it up a little bit. So it's the production of trying to keep the pace of the thing to make it listenable and enjoyable and not have extraneous noises or delays or repeats or dropouts or clicks or stuff like that. So it is actually pretty time consuming. I mean, time consuming, not in hours, but days, weeks, months of editing for hours and hours and hours. And that was not something that I was really thinking was gonna be the case. It's much easier when I have a, an interview where the person's in the same room with me. I don't have to do hardly any of those kinds right. of things because there's no stuff to have to shift around. Didn't you have a squeaky chair though problem? There were squeaky chair problems a few times, <laughs> yeah. You know? So, I mean, that's you'll hear a few squeaks every now and again. You're going to hear some clicks. You're going to hear some dropouts and stuff like that, especially on the ones where, uh, like I said, it's recorded over the internet on a Zoom call. Uh, So, for example, the Joe Satriani episode, which I'm working on right now for the Four Unlawful Carnal Knowledge record, that one, he didn't record his voice with a separate microphone. So it's only the audio from the Zoom call. And there's dropouts and there's all kinds of little things that happen that garble his speech every so often. Mm -hmm. And so I either have to let that ride or chop those bits out and hope that what's missing still makes sense enough. You know, so that's kind of the, the thing that I'm going through right now. But I've also had to do some stuff with his voice in particular to make it sound a little bit more, I don't know, like have some sound character to it that's a little better than the source from just the Zoom audio. So I have done a little bit of things like run it through a tape machine plugin and run it through some other things just to give it some texture. Beef it, beef it up. Yeah, just to give it something so it sounds a, a little bit more enjoyable to hear because the the stock audio is lacking a little bit so these little small decisions people may or may not ever know even take place they will now if they uh they watch this but but that's a lot of stuff and i i do it all myself because i am the one that knows what i want to hear in terms of the pacing of all of the stuff so i can't really give that task to someone else. There might be certain things where somebody could scan for noises and get rid of certain things. But 
at the end of the day, the whole thing still has to come together uh, in the pacing that feels like something I want to listen to. I think a lot of people also wonder, you know, how come it takes so long sometimes for certain episodes? There's all the technical things that we're talking about, but then there's also the fact that you know, there's so many things also happening at the same time in my life, other projects that I have to be spending a little time. So it's this balancing act that gets to be a challenge, especially when there's a, um, an episode that requires a lot of technical manipulation with all the edits to make stuff sound as good as it can be. So uh, that's, that's the challenge is like, how do I, how do I find the time to, to do them all, plus the other projects, plus have family life balanced. You know, like I start looking at a daily schedule and it's crazy. It's like, well, I got at 10, 15, I got to walk the dog. You know, I got to, you know, it's like there's, everything is kind of getting uh, regimented into this schedule just to try to stay on top of these things. So it's, it's a little bit of a challenge, you know, it's like, um, like a military schedule. The quality of this. It's a standalone project where people can go back and listen to this as a reference point to a lot of your Hamilton fans. It's, it's a collection piece. It's not just a show. It's not a weekly TV show. You know what I mean? This yeah, I mean, a, I was hoping originally to be able to do all the interviews in person with everybody, which really would speed up the process of yeah. the post-production element. But it turned out to be not the case. I think I've done two or three in person, Steve Vai, Blue Saracino, James Valentine. That might be it. The rest of them are all over the internet. So that's been- That's crazy. The, that's been a lot of the hard work, you know? Was it, was it Blue's, who's, yeah, Blue's talking about the, the, the Eagles, right? The Van Halen Eagles shirt? Oh, the Eagle Talon shirt, right. I had never seen that logo I had. And, you know, so I was saying to him, I don't know about that one, but uh, so he, after the fact was scouring the internet and found it. And he's like, I told you, you know, cause I didn't know if it was a, re a real Van Halen one or if it was a, just a bootleg version. Right. Cause I don't remember seeing that logo or that t-shirt at the shows that I'd been to. And the other thing is when you interview people, it's challenging whether it's me or, or an artist, and generally it's me, I'm gonna to talk to you. You're really good at speaking and doing interviews. You've been doing this for so long, you probably can do it in your sleep. Some artists, you, despite of how energetic or how much they bring to the table, you still have to edit, you know? And well, that's something you don't expect also. That's the thing is it. that I, I think a listener doesn't necessarily know that some of the conversation is edited in certain ways. And, the goal would be to not have to do it, but if there are times when somebody's trying to get a point across and they are not stuttering, but they're repeating certain phrases, saying and and and, um, and like um, and, um uh uh that kind of stuff, if you have a lot of it you start to tune out as a listener. So those kinds of things are removed in most podcasts, unless the thing is just so streamlined that they're like, okay, it is what it is. And it just goes out. So that would be ideal. Then you could do 10 episodes a day. But right. in this kind of scenario where you want this to be listenable and enjoyable, and you can feel a good flow of the conversation. Sometimes those kinds of edits are necessary. And it is a challenge to know when you're speaking, to be aware enough to not add those little pause things where you're trying to figure out what you're saying, but while you're saying it, you're saying something. It's better to be silent than to be saying, uh, uh, like, uh, and, uh, uh, so those kind of things just happen in normal conversations and most people aren't aware of that. Right. But the weird part is if somebody's doing that a lot, then I'll find myself doing it as well. And part of the problem with doing this stuff over Zoom is that 
the person is waiting to hear you. There's a delay. Yep. And if we start talking at the same time, then there's those pause moments as well. So stuff gets interrupted and there's those things of, uh, uh, oh, and that kind of stuff. Yep. And then when you listen to it, you think, ah, oh, I know this is going to be a pain in the ass to edit, but I don't want to hear that every time I listen to this. So I got to go and get rid of those things. So sometimes it's the elements of just the delay or somebody not hearing what you said because you're not in the same room. So, you know, there's just little artifacts that really have to be smoothed over or taken care of to make the episodes be uh, a more exciting listen. Well, I, I know it. I think, you know, um, I become more aware of my speech. Like everyone just does it. You don't realize that you start talking and watching and having to edit yourself in the video, which is so painful. And from the first time we started doing this, our show is talking to now, I've learned so much. So I can appreciate when you do these, these podcasts and it, it does feel like that. I know the amount of work and effort you put into it. It's like, it's, it's totally like a conversation without any breaks, which is pretty unheard of when you're doing these kind of shows. It really right. is. So to me, it's, I, it's very enjoyable because knowing I do so much editing all the time on this show, I know if you just put your podcast on and it just feels like it's a totally flowing conversation. That's, you know, I like try to make it flow as best as I can, you know, and every so often uh, there's things that I will break it up with musical examples and, and other little bits so that there's a chance for you to keep your focus. I think a lot of people experience a shorter attention span these days than maybe 20 years ago. So there has to be some kind of new shiny object to get their attention and bring them back. Right. And that just sort of happens where it feels like it needs to happen. It's good, but I also think that the inhaling, your music, your dad's music, a lot of the fans are gonna suck it up and listen on through. It's a very loyal crew. So a big bulk of the people. So really to you, it's a lot of the new people coming onto the show that haven't been exposed as much have you found people, any feedback from people saying, I didn't know this was being handled. But since the show, have you got any feedback on that? Well, from the people in the community on the website, there are a lot of people saying the same kind of things that you're saying where they go back to the records and they hear them differently or they're, they're so excited to hear some new perspective or a shared story from somebody that got to meet Edward or meet members of the band. But what I think comes across a lot that people really enjoy is when you hear people actually play parts in the episodes, like Paul Gilbert playing David Lee Roth vocal melodies on the guitar. That was yeah. a really exciting thing for me to hear, but the fans also really enjoyed it. Yep. Um, and Satchel playing a lot of the licks from the Van Halen one debut album and Greg Howe as well. So when you have people playing parts and we can talk about a specific thing and, oh, on that particular string or what fret are you playing that on or talking about the differences, the subtle differences in the way each guitar player might try to play the part. And that's the kind of detail that for me as a kid growing up, any of my friends, if we were talking about the, this stuff, that's the kind of stuff that we got into. So I just wanted to extrapolate that, take that further with any of the guests and so there are some guests that are much more capable of about talking uh, about the details and demonstrations of stuff mm -hmm. and others that that's not their wheelhouse. They love the music, but they're not super technical. So they that's you jump in. Yeah. You know, so there, there's a little bit of a balance in between. And I think the people that are listening to the, the podcast most of them, my guess, is that they like the people that are more detailed, uh, uh, detail oriented when it comes to those playing examples and stuff, because there's a lot to be learned in those moments. Oh, yeah. To me, I'll hear you and you'll talk about a certain thing. I'll stop and I'll be like, I'll listen. I'll think like that. And within a second, it's like a, a shot of earth. And when somebody's like zooms in to the country, to the town, to the house, yeah. to the apartment, to the person, like a sniper. Bam, you're, you're right there with the example. It's like, it's just, 
you know. Yeah, I try. I try to with with anything that I want to really drive the detailed point home. I try to have the example of the music happening while it's being described, and even go back and listen again and talk about a specific part one more time, just to to give the perspective, to hear it a couple of times, and really zone in on what we're trying to share. Uh, so that's how I like to listen for details in music myself. So that's the way that I go about it. I don't know if sometimes that might be too much for the listeners, but I, I do what feels natural to me and what I would want to hear in that kind of scenario. So mostly I think people enjoy the, those layers of detail. Yeah, I think on your website, and this is actually where you can get it, is on his website, we'll have the link, we'll talk about that at the end to when we wrap it up. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, yeah, that's just too much information, Weasel. I don't think I've ever heard, like, <laughs> man, could you just lay off and just keep it fluffy? I mean, it's, it's you know, we all want more. It's, it's such a good product, you know, and it, the facts are so good. How are you, are you literally just going online to get the music? How, how are you finding some of the quality of the audio and some of these facts coming into it? Well, the thing is, some of the the uh, elements that I'm using that are isolated, all that stuff exists on the internet. Anybody can just type in isolated Van Halen guitar and find some of that stuff. So if there's some stuff where the quality doesn't sound like I want it to sound, if it's a bootleg of something and I want to use a musical example, I'll run it through some stuff. I'll run it through some compressors or some EQs or things, and I'll make it sound better for what I need it to sound like in the in these examples. So I've had uh, I've seen some people saying, you know, I never heard that part sound that good before. Right. Uh, and there are little bits and pieces when they're talking about those things. Some of those are coming from isolated sources and stuff like that where it's mixed together. And uh, so if people are enjoying it, that's a good thing, but it's all from stuff that's out there. And every now and again, you know, I have to do a little bit of doctoring to make it uh, sound like it should to fit into the whole thing. Well, that's it. Cause I've never heard some of these things the way they are and the quality of things out there and especially some of the other sites, you know, even a site that this will be on, it's not always the best. And even though it is isolated, it's pretty horrible. It sounds like it's on a flip phone. So the quality that, that, that we're hearing these things are like, it's crazy. But now you got to get yourself a nice studio, the one you're sitting in right now, up and running. Yes. Well, that's so, the other thing that's also been taking up some time is trying to get everything all going. This has been a, I mean, almost eight year process to get a studio up and running from just getting stuff built and getting stuff installed and testing and and things so uh it's when you have all of these things all happening all at the same time it is pretty overwhelming so i try to do my best to stay focused and stay on task with with things but uh this particular room that i'm sitting in it became something different than it was supposed to be and that's mainly because of COVID. So in the ceiling, you can see there are some speakers. Mm -hmm. And well, let's see, yeah. Yep. So the, uh, the extra speakers are Atmos speakers. So that means that I can now start working on my own music and music collaborations with other people where the music can be totally immersive. So not only can I have stuff that surrounds, it can also come up and over and you can have the feeling of things rising and falling. So you can think about writing music that already impacts you in that way. And that's a whole new frontier. So I haven't even had a chance to do that yet. I have been recently doing some mixing, just learning the ins and outs of how to best use this extra real estate in the speakers but the 
the ultimate goal is to be able to start delivering this immersive music on my website and have people have a chance to hear things like they've never heard before. So you can imagine, here's the crazy thing, Atmos with speakers, it's a, it's a, cra- it's a, it's a very crazy experience, especially in a room that's designed to play it back properly. Right. But the average person's not going to hear it that way because it's rare that you have a very finely tuned room uh, in everybody's house, right? So what you have is the headphone version. Right. And you can hear it from a phone or a laptop or wherever you're listening to this Atmos file. But what you'll get is the experience of things that will spin around, you'll, you'll, they'll go behind you, in front of you, and up and over, even in earbuds, even in a regular pair of headphones. So it's amazing technology now where you can have this three-dimensional immersive experience. And the more it can be tied into the actual composition from the beginning, the more natural the whole immersive experience will be because if you're already building these moments where stuff is supposed to be creating this thing that you're supposed to experience, then it will always feel like it was supposed to do that versus you're used to the sound of a stereo mix and now you start making stuff spin around. If you go too crazy with it, it becomes disconnected and it's not optimized for a listening experience. So there's a lot to be learned uh, of what are the best ways to bring stuff to life. And every song is really different. So for example, you can do things like, let's say you have the left center, right, the front speakers, and you got the rear speakers. And you decide that when a soloist starts playing, the band moves back and it goes into the back and the soloist stays in the front. Mm -hmm. Now that might not work for every situation, but in the situations where it does, it's amazing because it feels super three-dimensional. It feels like you can reach out and touch this instrument and the atmosphere around it, the reverb and the delays. And then when you have that extra bit of height, it's that much more realistic and feels like you're, you're just inside the music so it's very exciting but i was not going to build an atmos room it just happened that when covid stopped the touring i was thinking well what is going to happen what am i going to be able to do to take things to another level to make it so that people will have a reason to want to rediscover whatever the music is that I'm working on of my own or even new projects or collaborations that I do with people. I needed to find something that would be inspirational that could also become, you know, the catalyst or some excitement for, for things to come. And there's really going to be some super cool things that come from it. I want to do a live album from the Hot Rats tour where I take all the best performances from the Hot Rats tour and do an Atmos release of our live presentation of Hot Rats. And I mean, when you hear some of this stuff all spread out, I mean, it's, it's so cool. It, it really is amazing. Um, Apple started doing their own version of, of Atmos recently. Have you heard any of that? Well, what Apple has done is they've created spatial audio, which is uh, just the the container for where all these immersive audio files exist for a listener. So Sony has their own version of this kind of spatial audio stuff, as does Dolby Atmos. All that it really comes down to is that this music is available Uh, And there's a codec that will play it back for you so that you hear it in this surround sensation. Mm -hmm. The headphone version is called binaural. And that kind of um, technology is going to keep improving and get better and better. But for me, the issue at the moment 
with the the way this stuff is being delivered on Apple and other places that are delivering this stuff is I think there eventually needs to be a specific version of a speaker mix and a headphone mix because you really need to treat a headphone mix differently so that you really get the details of this stuff right. because the technology that exists allows you to have a speaker mix fold down to a stereo headphone mix that has these effects in it. But sometimes the effects that you have worked on for the speaker mix don't translate as well. They might need to be more focused, you know? And so you only have the range of far, mid, or close in the binaural and you don't have much else. You can take what already exists and decide, oh, that needs to be close, middle or far away, but you don't have any of the gaps in between. So that's gonna improve over time. Uh, but still the best experience that you're gonna get in headphones is if somebody was to really specifically work out those mid, far, you know, near, scenarios and get those effects to really live properly in a headphone mix, which could be different than what happens in the speaker mix. I, I checked it out. I noticed the pop music. I, like I said, I don't think it's true to what it is anyhow. And because you've been speaking about it for a while now, I was like, oh, let me check it out. Classical music felt like you were more in the room. Everything else, it kind of felt like it wasn't there yet, you know, in the mix. Well, the thing is, sometimes the stuff might not actually be uh, translating properly. Right. I know there are issues like, for example, there might be tracks that are playing. If you, I've, I've already heard it happen once. Uh, if you, if you have a phone that you can play spatial audio from yep. certain tracks, if like, for example, uh, ACDC's Highway to Hell, mm -hmm. I heard that track the other day and Angus Young's guitar was completely missing. So however it was processed and put on to the service that Apple's providing, something's wrong with the playback. The metadata is wrong. It's not reading it properly. So that guitar is gone. So that- That's kind the of, song. Yeah, those kind of problems <laughs> exist. So you might've heard a song or two where the metadata was missing right. and didn't play back right. So that's all stuff that is gonna get fixed at some point, but it's still, the idea is so worth exploring. It's just, there's a lot of technical things that have to be corrected. Do you think it's two schools with your music though? So you do a live version of that most, it's, you're already playing live, so you're not really doing anything different. So you just really make it sound the best using that most technology. But when you're recording with it, it could be a rabbit hole. Well, it really depends. So for example, a live concert, I still would do a lot of things like parse out the arrangement so that you have enough space. Let's say there's a marimba part. I might want that marimba part to live partially in the ceiling and partially in the back, not in the front at all. And let's say there's a keyboard part. I might want the keyboard part on the opposite side and I wanna leave the guitar, the bass and the drums in the front and then maybe put some percussion in the back and put right. the vocals in the middle. So you may want to explore all these things and song by song, it could be totally different. And you can have stuff shift and move around and pan and go up and over and all these things. It doesn't have to be a gimmick. It can be something that really helps you feel the music. And that's the exciting part is that it's, it's just a lot more real estate to place the sounds in the speakers, you know, in a stereo mix. You only have two speakers and you have a phantom center. So right. you try to fit all this stuff in there and you have to compress it. You don't have to use as much compression in Atmos because there's so much more room and it sounds fuller and you just have all this um, space to, to just let it breathe. So you think that's gonna be your thing after the podcast is done before you roll up your sleeves and take out five more projects? I think I'm gonna definitely do some more stuff with uh, the Atmos thing. I have I have concerts uh, that I wanna do, but I also have DVD ideas. I have a lot of filmed concerts and I'd like to be able to take the music and uh, go ahead and mix it in Atmos and have those things become streamable on my website. 
so the apostrophe concert that is a concert film, that one is already mixed in, it's edited, it's mixed in stereo, it's mixed in 5.1, but it's not mixed in Atmos. So I need to do that. And, uh, and then I'll be ready to put that version out. It's, that's going to be probably one of the, the best things that I've ever been able to put together because the performances are great. The footage looks great. And it's the apostrophe album. It's one of my dad's most popular records. We play the entire record, but then we play another 15 songs or so. Uh, and there's a, just a, a whole lot of music and George Duke plays with us. So it's, it's a really exciting piece of work. I'm looking forward to it. Um, to wrap this the, on, the, on the podcast and the Van Halen, what, what do you have coming up? Any special stuff you can do? Because I know you do some listening parties. You had some little special things going on. Where are you Those at with are that things part? That have been a bit of a challenge to sort out uh, technically, and I think we're going to start doing the listening parties a little more frequently in the coming weeks because I've been having to deal with certain things in my studio to get spaces ready and have things hooked up so it's easy to do. It mm -hmm. uh, hasn't been so easy for me to do that uh, up until you know the coming weeks where it looks like we'll be able to jump in and make those more, um, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, interactive. Because before, the first one that I did, I wasn't able to see a lot of incoming questions or things okay. that people might have been saying at the same time. So it, it just feels like I'm talking to no one. And, and that, was, uh, that was an experience that I tried to make as, as um, entertaining as I could, but it still feels awkward because I'm thinking, uh, well, I don't know if anybody's even watching this. I don't know if anybody's listening to this. I don't know what's going on here. So I, there was uh, uh, someone else had a, another computer running and they were kind of telling me, oh, this person's saying this, but it's distracting to hear other information right. at the same time. So I'm um, going to get that better sorted out. And But as far as other upcoming things, I still have several more episodes to record. I recently did a bonus episode with Joe Bonamassa where we talked about Van Halen and his influence uh, in guitar and blues guitar. But Joe was not, he's not a Van Halen disciple. So he's more coming at it like, I have a lot I wanna learn. What can you tell me about this, this person named Edward Van Halen, <laughs> you know? So um, that episode's a little different because we don't really go super detailed uh, about a lot of the playing and the music, we talk about a few other things and how- Joe's very engrossing there too. He's very engaging as a, as a interview Yeah, I think, too, so. I think people will like uh, what we were talking about, but it's definitely not at the core of what running with the dweezil is based on. This is more of a, a conversation that, that talks about a lot of different things about music. Van Halen is involved throughout the conversation, but it kind of goes in some other directions, which I think people will enjoy, uh, but that's a bonus episode because uh, mm -hmm. we were able to get a chance to talk to him. And I, I did a, an episode recently with John Shanks, who produced the final Van Halen album with Dave and Wolfgang was um, on that record. And so that one was a pretty lengthy conversation. I mean, I think it uh, totaled something close to four hours. So there's going to be some editing involved in, in that one. <laughs> Might have to be a double bonus episode. Yeah, maybe. So we'll see. But I have some other things where I've got a friend of mine named Craig Adams that he's got a lot of interesting stories. We're going to probably talk about the wildlife soundtrack. And so these are some other kind of details that you, you don't find a lot of information about. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And didn't Ed, Ed did um, an adult uh, themed uh, soundtrack to a couple singles, didn't he, out there? There's like a, some weird video online. Songs that ended up in, there's a video called Catherine. Uh, yes. Which uh, that's a, a video that, you know, 
I don't know that we had anything planned to talk about that in particular, but that was around the Van Halen three period, you know, when mm -hmm. Gary Sharon was in the band yep. and all the stuff that was going on up at uh, 5150. So I don't know that we're focusing that much attention on that stuff, but it may get discussed here or there. It was just an offbeat song. You're like, because yeah. you, we talk a lot about Eddie doing solo albums. And to me, I'm like, kind of feels like a solo thing. Like, but he really wasn't in that right space <laughs> you yeah, know, to do the solo at that point. I mean, I think we've even said it in different ways on different episodes, but Edward yeah. said many times in various different ways that Van Halen was already a solo right. project. I mean, there was plenty of guitar, like how much more guitar did you want, basically? And Van Halen fans were like, uh, I'll take another 50 oh. or 60% more. <laughs> sure, why not, you know? I think the fact is that the only difference with solo is it felt like he, Edward did have to compromise on certain songs, like no keyboard, turn off this, and it, you know, whereas a solo album, he'd be, do whatever he wanted, you know, it'd be full right. on things. So last thing to end us on for people that aren't already part of your website, let's talk about just and on, on the website and how people can find the podcast. So dweezozappa.com is an interactive site and it has all my music on it and there's a lot of video stuff and there's the podcast series, Running with the Dweezel. And it's a podcast that is a for sale podcast. So you can buy it episode by episode if you like, or you can buy it in different bundles. So there's one that is the early years, which only talks about the first six classic Van Halen albums. And there's a couple little bonus episodes in that bundle as well. Mm -hmm. But then there's a bundle that's called Right Here, Right Now, which is the Sammy and Gary Sharon era, which is everything minus the Dave era, and which also has some bonus episodes in it. And then there's the 5150 bundle, which has everything in it, plus a special episode which hasn't been recorded yet, which will be about how to achieve the brown sound, the Van Halen guitar sound, the various different ways you could go about getting that sound in the studio or live on stage. And that's gonna be an interesting one because I'll also be making presets for Fractal and for some Line 6 devices and some, maybe some other devices that will be able to have a preset that you can just load in and it will just be that sound, you know? so. There's going to be a, a handful of different sounds that I'll make for that. But the experience of going into the studio and saying, here's what you can do to get this sound. And it doesn't have to be with the, the same exact equipment that Edward mm -hmm. used, because you can get the same sound or very close to the sound with different things. That's excellent. And they also get the full one gets the magazine too, right? Because you're. Oh, yeah. They, well, because it's in partnership with guitar, uh, Premier Guitar, the 5150 bundle also gets a one year free membership uh, subscription for the Premier Guitar magazine. And so because these are uh, broadcasts that are a pay per view, pay per uh, listen, it's not a video, it's, it's just an audio uh, product, uh, we also, have been donating to two popular charities that were known to be charities that Edward Van Halen already participated in some way with the, uh, one of them was a way to help feed people. They had done a lot of food drives on tours and they were, they were getting fans to bring um, cans of food and, and dry goods and things. So it was important to be able to spread that message and make sure that people could, um, you know, not suffer in that way. So uh, Feeding America is one of the things. And then we have Mr. Holland's Opus, right. which was to give musicians or children in schools the opportunity to have music classes and have their hands on good instruments. And Edward gave away a lot of his own guitars to Mr. Holland's Opus. So we've been donating to these charities as a way to just have this whole thing be something that is for the greater good for the Van Halen fans, do something that will 
give everybody uh, something that will make them look forward to enjoying the music that much more. But, you know, uh, it, it takes a lot of time and effort and, uh, to, to, to put this whole thing together. So it is a pay uh, subscription style podcast. And these days you're seeing a lot of podcasts become a, a pay per lesson kind of. Uh, right. Or go on some kind of tier of something you have to yeah, join and sign up to. subscription based kind of concept. Uh, and it, it really does end up making sense because there's so much work involved in doing the episodes. So, you know. Well, that was, that was the point for me to talk about how much work you're putting into this and to let people know it's just not a podcast or someone's just talking. Like it's a full on project. It's not just somebody, you know, saying, saying, you know, whatever that comes off the top of their head and then hitting it and then sending it out. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're, they're kind of like little mini audio movies that are mm -hmm. mini audio documentaries about each album. And the bundle's so worth it. Like the, the value, like besides just from the charities and, and the extra bonuses and it's, it's, the guitar magazine, I mean, it's it's beyond worth the value of it too. So it's really, you know, a full package. Well, I, get the whole I, I feel like, um, you know, at the end of the ride, when all of the episodes are done, it will be something that any Van Halen fan can use as a, a, a good reference to learn and enjoy. And anybody that's never heard Van Halen they're going to have the benefit of all of this information to binge listen to in, you know, that's, that's the, the culture of today, binge watching or binge listening. Yeah. If, if, if the whole series was done, I'm sure there's some Van Halen fans that would get through it in a weekend, you know, like every, cause there's 30 episodes that are planned for the, the whole, you know, the whole uh, life of the, the podcast. And there may be some extra bonus ones that end up in there too, but 30 episodes and they're all over an hour, you know, the, it, it, some it's of these better this way. Let, let it marinate, you know what I mean? What was that? It's better to let it marinate for a little bit of time between and want yeah. them. It's like in the old days, you, the show's going to be coming up. You, it's exciting. Yeah. If I got it, if you ate all that I want, it'd be like going to a buffet. It'd be too much, you know? Yeah. Well, that's not going to stop some people from totally binging it. <laughs> I, know. I know i think it's great you know take your time do it as you go spend time with your family you gotta be refreshed and, and you know yeah be the I, best i do i do the best i can it is a challenge though that you know it's balance that's excellent you know the well, the bundle the 5150 bundle is the one that gets gets you everything including those presets and all that stuff uh and the the magazine subscription but if you only want to hear certain episodes, you can buy a la carte. Sure. There, there are some people that had never heard Van Halen, but the first Van Halen record they heard was Van Halen 3. And they could have been fans of that record, hearing that band just that way. And that's the fascinating thing about music is they might hear that and go, that's my favorite. And then hear some of the other stuff and go, oh, I don't get it. That happens with my dad's music all the time. There's different records that my dad has made where right. somebody, it's always fascinating to me if somebody finds a really difficult to listen to record of my dad's, like there's a record called Thing Fish. I was gonna say that. That's a very <laughs> difficult record to listen to. But I know people that that's the first record they got and they got way into it and they love it. And they can listen to that like they're listening to you know whatever their other favorite pop music is and then they listen to some other stuff of my dad's and like yeah i don't i don't like that as much as i like this thing fish part so it's it's so strange uh, because it's different strokes for different folks but generally speaking when somebody comes in on the weirder stuff and they mm -hmm. like that and then they get into the rest of it those are the ones that tend to like everything because they're open-minded and they want to be able to to be excited about the variation and the depth of creativity in the music and that's the same kind of stuff that we're highlighting in the van halen podcast is the variation in the in the music the songwriting styles the production styles the guitar playing itself the techniques 
all of that stuff, we talk about it. And it's, for me, it's always been fascinating because I've loved the music always growing up. So it's, it's exciting to talk to other people that also love it. And there's also focus on the vocals and on the bass and some great points on the drums. I really appreciate it. So it's, it's all there for the fans. I mean, so I want to thank you for being on the show tonight, man. Sure. Thanks for having me. Well, anybody who wants to check it out, go to dweezilzappa.com and find Running with the Dweezil.